Hi everyone, welcome to the Spring 2016 EdCollab Gathering workshop number two. Uh, today's workshop will be presented by Rebecca O'Dell and Allison Marchetti. Today, Al Rebecca and Allison will talk to you about bringing discovery and play back into the writing classroom. Please remember to join in on the conversation by tweeting your comments or questions to the EdCollab Gathering space two. All right, over to you, Rebecca and Allison. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. We are very excited to talk to you about play and discovery in writing. Um, just a reminder to tweet at us using the hashtag the Ed Collab Gathering and our individual handles at Allison Marquette and at Rebecca Odell One. We are really happy to be spending the next 45 minutes with you. Today we are going to talk about play and discovery. Specifically, we are going to establish the importance of play and discovery in our writing classrooms. We are going to define what notebook time is. This is where a lot of play and discovery begin. And we'll show how it's used to enhance these things. We're also going to share different kinds of notebook time invitations with you, as well as student samples and we'll share resources for creating your own notebook time invitations. So because of um, really fun stuff like copyright law, we can't <laughs> show you everything we would love to show you in real life. We can't show you the images that we would be showing our students. So we have linked them all to our blog. Um, you can see the link right now. I think it's movingwriters.org slash presentations slash the Ed Collab Gathering. You can go there and get our slides from today's presentations, and you can also get the links to all the resources that we're going to share with you. Um, you can use them today, pull them up as we talk about them so that you can see what our students would be seeing. But also, you can use these next week in your classroom when you decide to try out some notebook time. They're going to stay up there for you so that you can get them anytime you need to. All right, so let's first talk a little bit about, little bit about um, why, why our students love notebook love time. Notebook. Um, um, I want to back up first back up up a little bit about the importance of play and discovery in our classrooms. Um, play and discovery help us to sort of challenge the, the sometimes crazy and heartbreaking notions that our students come to us, uh, uh, the things that they think about writing. Writing is hard, it's not fun, it's boring. Um, writing is a formula. Writing is putting one sentence down after the other. Um, you know, these are things that um, students have really learned over the years and um, we, we need to do um, you know we need to do some work to, to sort of counteract and um, uproot those kinds of thinking so play and discovery what does this look like and I'm, I'm hoping actually to see a slide here um, that uh, defines what play and discovery is that the slide um, Will you give a nod Rebecca because I can't see the, the slide are you seeing the right one <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to go off here and hopefully this will work. So what does play mean? Well, play means a lot of different things. It might mean uh, experimenting with punctuation and trying on different punctuation marks and seeing how that affects the meaning of a sentence. It might mean writing through an idea that's a little bit fuzzy and, and writing through until you find some clarity. Um, it might mean trying on different personas. It might mean emulating a favorite writer's style. Um, you know, it, it, it can really mean whatever whatever you want it to mean, but the idea is that students are really freed from the rules that have sometimes defined their writing experiences in the past um, and invited to, to play and discover. Uh, now, play and discovery can take lots of different forms in the classroom. I want to talk now about one way to make that happen, and this is called notebook time. Notebook time is five to seven minutes in our classrooms of risk-free ungraded writing. I really want to stress the risk-free and the ungraded writing. Students aren't getting, you know, 10 points for completing this exercise that is notebook time. Uh, it's just a time to write and play and discover. Um, and so what this looks like, um, this is, you know, a dedicated amount of time at the beginning of every class period. Students are being exposed to lots of different genres of writing and information in our world. 
Um, we are creating writing routines and habits for them when we start every class period with the same kind of risk-free ungraded writing. Um, they are working on fluency and building their writing muscles because they do it daily. Small victories happen, small and large victories happen in notebook time. Um, you know, students uh, are, you know, celebrated for, for writing on a daily basis and then sharing those things with their peers. Um, and this is where we really nurture a lot of the writing that, you know, they're trying to do and, and help them get to more substantial pieces as well. So we asked our students this week what they wanted to tell you about notebook time. Um, you know, they, they love that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and here's some of what they said. There's a slide for this, um, what our students say about notebook time. I think we're a little bit behind on our slides. There you go. Perfect. I can see it. Okay. Um, so our students said that notebook time helps them uncensor their brains. Um, Nick said, I like hearing the different interpretations that everyone has of the same picture or the poem or the piece of data. So it's helping them, you know, expand their perspectives by hearing what their peers are thinking about. Joseph said that notebook time helps you with drafting because you get good at putting words on the page, just building those writing muscles and fluency. And then Sydney says, I always learn something new during notebook time. It also helps you explore a wide range of genres to help you find out what you like to write. So it helps our students also figure out, you know, what kind of writers are they? What works for them as writers? What doesn't work for them as writers? So you might be wondering, okay, how is Notebook Time different than the bell ringer I've been doing for years? Um, and Allison and I also did bell ringers for years that we didn't call Notebook Time. We did quick writes, um, which you're probably familiar with from um, Penny Kittle and Donald Graves and writing workshop in general. But it actually was... Penny Kittle, um, our guru of all things writing, who helped us expand our view of um, what notebook time could be and the ways that we could offer our students play. So we do sometimes rely on their writing territories and give them absolute unlimited free choice and just sit down and write for five minutes about whatever you're thinking. But we also use notebook time and the invitations we're going to share with you today to put a real emphasis on playfulness, on risk taking, on asking students to um, asking students to try something that they've never tried before, um, and then helping them build the skills that are going to make richer writing overall. Whether that piece of notebook time becomes anything or not, um, we are going to help them um, develop skills that just make them better writers overall. All right, so let's talk about the rules of notebook time. Uh, you should see a slide that has a few suggestions, uh, rules, or guidelines for making notebook time student-friendly and exciting um, and helpful for students. Um, first of all, we want to mention that a lot of these rules come from and were adapted from uh, Natalie Goldberg's Writing Down the Bones. Uh, this is a wonderful book that you should pick up, um, you know, complete with writing exercises and just different ways to think about making writing happen. Um, but before you, you should see a slide called The Rules of Notebook Time, and the rules are pretty simple. Um, we really want our students to keep their hands moving moving the whole time. Uh, and this is to build the writing muscles and to ensure that the thinking that's happening in their heads is being made transparent. And that can be really hard for students, but we want them to try to get whatever is in their brain down on the page. Um, and, and what this means, and I'm skipping down a little bit to the fourth point you see there, but if what they're thinking is, I don't have anything to say, this is boring, I don't know what to write, we actually recommend they write just that. Eventually they'll sort of tire of those notions and come on, and, come on to something different. Um, we want them to think and to get that thinking on paper, but we don't want them to think too much. Uh, we want them to think to the uh, extent that they are outrunning the sensor in their heads. Um, we don't want them to criticize thoughts that are coming into their brains as they do. We just want them to think and to transfer that thinking onto the page. We tell them not to worry too much about grammar and punctuation. Certainly, if you think a period should go there, put one there, but don't stop and deliberate uh, about a punctuation mark or the right word. That's something that comes later. Really, we want them to let the ideas lead. Also, 
um, you know, well, and, and that's actually just it, to, to let the ideas take you where they take you. And so if, you know, you're writing a, a memory down and then all of a sudden you're writing about um, your thoughts on the current uh, political culture environment, that's okay. You can switch gears like that and, again, just let the ideas lead. So today we're going to share four kinds of notebook time with you that we do with our students um, routinely that helps them discover new ideas, that helps them discover new topics, that helps them build writing skills that they haven't practiced before and maybe don't know if they can do. Um, like I said earlier, we definitely give them opportunities for just free, free writing or, you know, responses to a prompt. But in addition to that, we use the four kinds of notebook time invitations that you see on your screen right now. Um, we offer them poems, we offer them sentence study, opportunities to play with raw data and images. So our students, you know, the first time that we put up an image in front of them, say from Humans of New York, and say, okay, write for five to seven minutes, they, they are unfamiliar with what to do with themselves. So this year, Allison made um, the charts that you see on the next slide. This is also linked in our notes today, so if you go to movingwriters.org slash presentation slash the Ed Collab Gathering, um, you can also get this chart and download it for your students. But this just gives them a way to start um, when we offer them these kinds of invitations. If they're really stumped, if nothing comes to mind, they can refer to this chart, which our students have glued into their notebook, um, and, and find some prompts to think about. What do you notice? What patterns do you see? What does this make you wonder about? We also tell them every single day that if something else that's not on this chart pops to mind, if they see this image from Humans of New York and are inspired to write a poem about the man pictured, um, they're absolutely welcome to. So we give them the chart as a way to help them get started if they're stumped, but we emphasize to them almost daily that this is not prescriptive, that they always can write anything that they're inspired to write that comes from that day's notebook time invitation. Okay, so let's start with poems. Happy National Poetry Month, by the way. Um, poems, why do we include poems in notebook time? Well, first of all, um, we believe that nothing matches the craft of poetry. Um, poetry offers a real opportunity to notice and try the very special craft moves of the poets that we love. Um, poems are, are small and students can really dig in to smaller texts. Um, a lot of students, when we present a poem, will use the first line to generate uh, one of their own poems, or sometimes even the last line, will take the last line of the poem, put it at the top of their page, and then write from that line. Um, some students also will take a poem's topic, so maybe a poem is speaking about a past memory or love or a special relationship, and that uh, poem's topic will inspire an idea in our students and they will write, you know, their own version of, of that poem. Um, really, any way in which a student is inspired by a poem, we tell them to go in that direction. So these are just some guidelines, but they should do with it um, whatever they're inspired to do. Okay, so we're going to show you sort of what this looks like, and um, we're going to begin with a poem called Things to Do in the Belly of a Whale by Dan Albergati. And this is a poem we love. I'm going to uh, read it out loud to you so you can hear it, but you can also go to our website uh, and find the actual poem printed there. So. Things to do in the belly of the whale by Dan Albergati. Measure the walls, count the ribs, notch the long days. Look up for blue sky through the spout. Make small fires with the broken hulls of fishing boats. Practice smoke signals. Call old friends and listen for echoes of distant voices. Organize your calendar. Dream of the beach. Look each way for the dim glow of light. Work on your reports. Review each of your life's 10 million choices. Endure moments of self-loathing. Find the evidence of those before you. Destroy it. Try to be very quiet and listen for the sound of gears and moving water. Listen for the sound of your heart. Be thankful that you are here, swallowed with all hope, where you can rest and wait. Be nostalgic. 
Think of all the things you did and could have done. Remember treading water in the center of the still night sea, your toes pointing again and again down, down into the black depths. We love this poem for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, it does allude to the story of Jonah. This might be a really nice opportunity to talk about uh, allusions and, and poems that uh, reference other pieces of literature and talk back to them. Um, we love that this poem is a list, and the title clues us into that fact, and each line is an item in the list. Um, your students might see that on their own. They might also notice that the beginning of each line begins with a command, speaking directly to the reader. Um, they might notice the specific details. They might notice little bits of humor. After all, the, um, you know, the poem is about being in the belly of a whale, and the suggestion is to organize your calendar. That's kind of funny, so you know, poems can be funny too. Um, <clears throat> so there are lots of things here that students can be inspired by. Uh, for me, one of my favorite lines is, um, find the evidence of those before you, and also listen for the sound of your heart. And so those are some lines that I might take and write from. What we're going to do right now is to show you how this works because we feel it's really important to model the experience of notebook time for students, especially in the beginning. And um, we do write alongside with our students when they are working in notebook time. We also have notebooks and uh, they're open and students can see that we're also engaging with these texts. But sometimes, especially when we're introducing different kinds of notebook times at the beginning of the year, we will do a demonstration in front of students. So I'm going to do that right now and I'm just going to switch over to my Word document. And I hope you can see that. It should say things to do with a 10-month-old. I have a 10-month-old at home right now, and I love that um, you know the I love the genre of this poem in list form. And so I'm going to do a little bit of writing in front of you right now. And I just tell my students to watch me and notice if I'm following the guidelines. Uh, or am I writing, uh, moving my hand constantly? Am I um, stopping to fix mistakes, or am I moving through those? Uh, am I letting the writing take me where it takes me? So I'm just going to model this for about 30 seconds. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so that was about 30 seconds of writing, and I'm going to now switch back over to the presentation. Let's see. Um, okay, hopefully that worked. Um, so again, just letting our students see us try on these, um, you know, different kinds of possibilities, um, and, and letting them sort of watch us struggle a little bit or not because sometimes the, the writing does flow uh, and, and sometimes it doesn't and I think it's important that they see um, that experience happening um, in our own writing notebooks. Okay, so the next type of um, invitation that we want to tell you about is sentence study. Sentence study is an awesome workhorse of our notebook time because it allows us to do so many things. It allows us to connect students with mentor texts, with mentor authors. Um, it lets them play around with sentence structures, which I don't know about you and your students, um, but my students are not always experimental with their sentence structure unless I put them in situations that ask them to be. So sentence study does that for us as well. It's also a place where we get to teach them a little bit about grammar and mechanics. Um, in, the, in the example I'm going to show you in a second, there's a, the use of an M dash, um, which gives us an opportunity to talk about what can an M dash do, what are situations in which you use the M dash. 
Um, it also gives us potential building blocks for bigger published pieces of writing. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of that too. So the example we have for you today um, is from a New York Times review of the book Echo by Pam Munoz Ryan. And what we would do is put this up on the screen, give students a chance to copy it down into their notebooks. Um, it says, after reading Pam Munoz Ryan's enchanting new novel, you'll never think of a harmonica the same way again. ...across years and over continents and seas to touch the lives of three embattled, music-obsessed children, and quite possibly save a life. So when we put this up, the kids write it down in their notebooks, and then they look for the patterns. They also make a list of noticings, which is really what they do um, every time they look at a mentor text, is they think about what they notice. Um, so <laughs> what they notice here is this frame. After reading this book, you'll never think of an object or an idea the same way again. Um, and then there's a little brief synopsis of the book which is something our students also struggle with when they're writing about literature, is giving like a brief synopsis. So on the next slide, I'll show you what one of my students did with it. This is Sydney, and she was writing a character study of Holden Caulfield um, in The Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> so she had played with this during notebook time and then actually brought it into a piece of formal published writing. Um, she wrote, after reading J.D. Salinger's classic, timeless novel, you'll never think of adolescence the same way again. The Catcher in the Rye, in The Catcher in the Rye, a young man spends three days in the city to find himself, and quite possibly lose himself, as he lets his fears about growing up get the best of him. It is through this young man, Holden Caulfield, that we see a new value placed on something we often take for granted, innocence. So, I'll be honest with you, this was like the most amazing <laughs> example that came out of this sentence <laughs> study. So, don't be upset if yours don't look this way the first time. This is also, you know, March when we did this. Um, so Sydney had had some practice. But you can see she's using that frame. She's using that idea of the M dash, which was something I pointed out to them when we were discussing notebook time that day. Um, and you see she actually added on to the frame too. So it was really a mentor sentence that took her own writing to the next level. Um, the next example that we want to share with you that we give to students is raw data. So when we, this is a really weird one, um, and this is an idea we did basically steal directly <laughs> from Penny Kittle. Um, she said that one of the things that professors notice a lot um, is that when kids get to college, they can't make sense of data. They can't make sense of statistics and, and charts and graphs and figure out what they really mean, what they're really saying. Um, so this is really addressing that. It is also really fun. I think that as our students get used to this, this is probably their favorite kind of notebook time invitation. It connects math and writing. It's really appealing to students for whom maybe English isn't, you know, their favorite or best subject. They're really more mathy, sciencey students. It, it makes a connection there to writing for them. Um, it helps our students find and use evidence in analytical writing, which as high school teachers is something we're really concerned with. They need to be doing a lot of different kinds of writing, but analysis needs to be one of those, and this can really help them with that. And this also has sparked the most topics for future writing among my students this year. Um, they really love this. So to see this example, you're going to have to go to our website again. It's movingwriters.org slash presentation slash the Ed Collab Gathering. And you will see a link to a piece of data we got from 538.com, which is one of our favorite sources um, for finding charts and graphs. And the chart that we pulled up for notebook time this time is the weirdest objects in the MTA lost and found. So all we do is we put it on the board. Students have those guiding questions in their notebook if they need them. Um, and we give them some time to write. You'll notice that there's like really weird stuff <laughs> lost in the MTA, lost and found, death certificates and tubas. Um, and students loved this invitation. If you're going to try data for the first time with your kids, I would recommend this one because every time they love it. So one of, here's some observations that my kids wrote down and shared with the class. Um, one student said, I noticed that for some reason the number of fashion costumes far outweighs the number of any other item. So they were imagining why that might be. 
Um, one student asked a question. How long have these items been in Lost and Found? What's the oldest item there? What's the newest? How often do they even clean out Lost and Found? I would like to write a story about that lost saxophone. Maybe the saxophone is the main character and it's a children's book. So that student was imagining ways that this could spark bigger pieces of writing. Um, or you could write a whole series of short stories about various objects in the Lost and Found and the people behind them. I love that suggestion from a student. It reminded me of um, Edgar Lee Masters and Spoon River Anthology, those poems that are all about people in a small town. And, and their kind of version of that, it would be all stories of people or objects that were lost in the MTA, Lost and Found. So after students have had some time to look at the data, um, we might just leave it here. We might just say, write your noticings and your questions and your ideas for future pieces of writing in your notebook. And then at some point down the road, they might go back to those ideas to flesh them out a little bit, to make them bigger, longer pieces of published writing. But at other times, we might say, we might you know, extend notebook time a little bit and say, OK, now go back to those things that you just wrote down about the chart in your notebook and pick one of them and write longer and write for another maybe three to five minutes about that one idea. Um, I do this often when kids are really engaged with the topic of the day or with the data and I can tell that they have a lot of ideas flowing and they're really excited about it um, because I sometimes want to give them the opportunity right then in the moment to try to flesh that piece out a little bit more. Um, so sometimes it stops here with what you see on, on the slide, with just those noticings and those ideas. Other times, we might say, OK, yep, this is going really well. Let's have an extra five minutes today to see where one of those ideas might lead you. So next, Allison um, is going to talk about images. I'm just going to pause for a brief min minute to address two questions that have come in through Twitter. Thanks for tweeting us. Um, one teacher is wondering um, how much teacher input should be given uh, as students are discovering a new invitation and thinking about what to do with it. I think this, this question was tweeted after the poem, Notebook Time. So um, at the beginning of the year when students are just getting used to seeing a little bit of writing and noticing things about the writing, we are doing more thinking out loud, certainly. So things to do in the belly of the whale. If I had shown that in the first week of school, I might be the one saying, it's a list. It is a poem that alludes to another piece of literature. There are commands at the beginning of every sentence. But as students become more comfortable with this format, and as students learn more things about writing and how to describe what they're seeing, we really shift the responsibility onto them. And just like another, any other participant in the class, if there's something we see that students haven't noticed yet, of course we'll share, but students are really doing more of the heavy lifting um, you know, in the second, third, and fourth quarters of the year after we've demonstrated that kind of thinking. And then someone else asked, when does notebook time happen? Um, in our classrooms, it does happen at the beginning of class. We like, we like it as a, a transitional activity, um, but it doesn't have to happen at the beginning of class. It can be folded into the writing portion of class. My, my only hesitation there is if students are doing notebook time and also trying to work on their piece of writing, they might actually work on the piece of writing instead of engaging in notebook time and really miss out on an opportunity to explore some new ideas and new, and new genres that they're not digging into during workshop time. So we like to keep them separate. However, the idea is that sense of play and discovery trickles down into everything we do in the class. So play and discovery isn't limited to notebook time, but having it at the beginning of class, I think, sets them up for play and discovery in whatever writing activity they're doing. Um, okay, we're going to move through images pretty quickly. Images are great. Um, you know, students can 
our, we live in an image saturated world and students need practice reading those images. Um, images can inspire all kinds of writing, fiction and nonfiction. And images can also emphasize the value of combining words and images for an effective piece of writing. So we often try to find images with well-written captions or images that are part of a longer photo essay. And so that brings us to our example today, which we actually both used in our classrooms this week. Um, as you know, there is a lot of discussion about what's happening in Cuba right now on the news. And so images can be a way to present current events to students as well in English class. There's a beautiful, beautiful photo essay called Cuba on the Edge of Change in the New York Times. And again, just go to our website, movingwriters.org, and, and find our resources there. Um, but this photo essay combines images of Cuba with little, vin little almost vignette-type um, captions. And so as you can see on this slide, um, our students had a lot of fun with this and were mesmerized by the pictures. But what we want to emphasize is that you know they did lots of different things in terms of their responses. One student started to write an editorial. He's very passionate about uh, Cuba and he wanted to start kind of putting some information and in his opinion out there. Another student uh, wrote in the persona of one of the women in the photos. And then another student used some of the repetition she saw in the images to bring repetition into her, her, her own writing, her own written response. All right. I think Rebecca's muted. I'm not hearing her. Yeah, can you hear there me? There we now? go. Perfect. Okay. Um, so those were our four types of invitations that we offer to students in addition to free writing opportunities. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about ways that we extend notebook time. So sometimes when it's going really well, we say, okay, take one of those ideas and run with it a little bit longer. Um, we also sometimes work on revision as a skill during notebook time. Again, this is an idea we got from Penny Kittle. Um, we can't take credit for it. We just love it. Um, I think you probably know that revision is not students' favorite, and it's not something that they're naturally good at. So if we can also make revision risk-free, if we can make revision a little bit more playful, if we can um, demystify it a little bit, then this, again, trickles down into every element of students' writing. Um, so after notebook time, on occasion, maybe, maybe once a week, maybe twice a week, um, we say, OK, you've written for five minutes. That's awesome. Now I'm going to set the timer. And I always set like a literal timer so they feel like they're racing against the clock. It makes it a little bit of a game. Um, I say I'm going to set the timer for three minutes or two minutes. Make whatever you have better than it was before through revision. So we ask them to do a little bit of editing maybe. They check spelling, mechanics, and grammar. Maybe they're adding it to their mm -hmm. ideas. Maybe they're adding details. Maybe they're combining sentences and working on fluency, getting rid of unnecessary repetition, um, trying out a different craft move from the mentor text um, that they didn't try the first time. And um, we let them like race against the clock. When Allison and I write with our students, we are also revising in front of them. Um, you can see on the screen, this was my revision from yesterday. Um, I was writing about cereal. We were doing a, a sentence study. And so I revise in different colors so that they can see what I'm doing. Sometimes I'll talk to them about what I'm doing. And again, like Allison said earlier, at the beginning, there's a lot more scaffolding, right? There's a lot more thinking aloud, talking aloud, walking them through exactly what we're doing. <clears throat> By the time we are at the end of March or the beginning of April, our students can do that automatically. And I can just say, I'm starting the timer. You've got two minutes to revise and make your writing better than it was before. So in the beginning of the year, notebook times might take a little bit more of your class time. It might take a little bit longer to do that supporting that the students need to see what's possible. But as you do that, and especially if you're doing it routinely, we do it daily because we see our students almost every day. Um, but maybe for you it's once a week. You know, maybe for you it's every Friday is notebook time time. Um, but as we do it routinely, as our students get used to it, as they get used to extend your idea, OK, go back and revise. Here's an image. Write something. Um, they can do these things automatically because they've had a lot of good practice. Um, notebook time, though, can also become something more. I alluded to this a little bit earlier with Sydney and her sentence study. And I told you that she put it into her Catcher in the Rye character study of Holden. 
Um, sometimes notebook time does honestly give them things that they run with later. So on your screen, I think you see um, Zach's notebook time one day. He was writing about the Washington Redskins. And this was a time um, when they were just writing about their writing territories. Zach loves sports. So we wanted to write about the Redskins season. And at the time we did this notebook time, the Redskins had only had like three or four games. So he was writing about how it went so far. Um, later in the semester for his portfolio, um, Allison and I both asked our students to go back into their notebooks, pick a notebook time they were really into, and turn it into a polished piece. By that time, the football season was pretty much over, and so Zach did. He went back to his original idea, he went back to some of his original concepts, and then he extended it into a polished, published now piece um, that he could <coughs> use for notebook time. Um, so sometimes it actually does become something more, but it's okay if it doesn't. You know, Allison said that this, this play and this sense of discovering things about yourself as a writer trickles down into everything. And so we're fine if notebook time just stays notebook time, if it doesn't become something more. Um, but sometimes it can, and that's great too. Okay, so uh, we want to talk a little bit about where and how we find these notebook time invitations. We are constantly sleuthing on a daily basis, um, excitedly sharing with one another what we discover. When we go to places like American Life in Poetry for our poems, um, the New York Times and the New Yorker for sentences. Sentences also come from our daily reading. Um, you know, what we read in the newspaper in the morning or what we're reading for pleasure. They can come from our students reading as well. So sometimes during readers workshop we will give a students a sticky note and we will ask them to jot down the most interesting, memorable, beautiful sentence they came across in their reading on that day. And that becomes sentence study for the next day's notebook time. Um, for images, we love the National Geographic resources. <clears throat> also, the New York Times has a great column called Pictures of the Day. Uh, Humans of New York is a wonderful resource. and um, we have actually built some longer writing studies around that resource and we have blogged a little bit about that at movingwriters.org if you're interested in checking that out. And data, really fun to find data. Our number one go-to source is 538.com. Um, but we also love The Atlantic and The New York Times. You'll often see charts and graphs embedded in longer articles. Um, but really, if you could go to one place for data, 538.com is just awesome. Um, I'll take a question um, really quickly. Someone asked, um, what are the best sentences for sentence study? Um, which is a really good question because not every sentence is going to work. So thank you for asking that. Um, with sentence studies, we try to look for sentences that have an obvious pattern that students could replicate or an obvious frame. So you saw with the one that I shared from the New York Times, you know, there were obvious places where we could take out the title of that book and insert the title of, you know, the book that the student's writing about. There were really obvious kind of structures and frames that they could just fill in their own information in. Um, we also look for sentences that might teach them something new about grammar or mechanics. So the sentence I shared with you, again, was kind of a super sentence, you know, because it did a lot of things for us. Um, but that M dash, perhaps, you know, we're noticing a student's writing um, or all of our students writing is weak in a certain area, like if I'm teaching compound sentences, for example, and I notice my kids really need to get a grip on how to properly punctuate a compound sentence, I might find a sentence that is a properly punctuated compound sentence for sentence study so I can force them to play with it, so I can talk to them a little bit about it in the context of real writing. So there's not, you know, one golden rule for the best kind of sentence, but I think it's a sentence that you can see easy inroads in for your kids. Um, so the last thing we wanted to tell you about for finding all kinds of notebook time inspiration is our mentor text Dropbox. Um, on our blog, we have a Google Drive um, uh, where we collect um, all kinds of mentor texts. But if you go to our website and you click on the mentor text Dropbox, there is a subfolder, I think it's folder number six, called Notebook Time. Um, and in there, we put everything we use for Notebook Time. And this really started because Allison and I just wanted to share with each other. 
Um, because when you find something really good, you don't want to just use it once, right? You want to share it with your friends. Um, but we also um, collect things that we get from you guys. So when you are out in the wild um, finding notebook time inspirations for your students, please email them to us uh, because we add them to the Mentor Text Dropbox so that everybody can pull them. But you'll find lots of data there, lots of images, um, all the sentence studies that we find we put in there um, so that we can all work together because um, it's really fun to go on a hunt for these things and it's amazing when you discover a really, really good one in your own reading. But it's also a lot of work, <laughs> so it's great when we can share and pool the resources and collaborate together. So we really would invite you to go there and pull from the resources we already have, but please, please, please share with us. As you find them, we will add them so we can all keep learning together. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been our pleasure. Um, we wanted to give a little shout out to our tech buddy um, working behind the scenes to help us with our slides. Thank you, Francis. We are really excited about play and discovery um, you know, at the center of our classrooms. And notebook time is, is one small slice of our class uh, our class time with our students. However, um, once you integrate notebook time into your teaching, we have found that almost everything we do becomes notebook time and is a you know an extension of notebook time in the sense that students are always bringing play and discovery into what they're writing about, even if we're not you know specifically engaged in notebook time in the first five to seven minutes of class um, the best thing too is when students come to you without being prompted and they say things like I have the best idea for notebook time tomorrow um, and and you know when this happens that students are beginning to really live like writers in a different way when they are uh, pulling from their environment um, things that might inspire and guide their own writing and wanting to share that with their peers and with us. Um, just like we created the Dropbox um, <clears throat> because we wanted to share with one another. When students bring ideas to you, it's because they want to share those bits of inspiration with one another. So we wish you the best of luck in uh, bringing notebook time and the um, ideals of, of play and discovery into your classrooms. Please feel free to continue to tweet questions at us. Um, <clears throat> or if you have any you know, thoughts about notebook time and other ideas that you'd like to share with us, feel free to leave some comments on our blog. Um, or again, tweet us at Allison Marquette and at Rebecca Odell one Again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful rest of the day um, checking out the other um, workshops available to you. We are definitely excited to sit down and watch some on our own. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison and Rebecca, for so many great techniques and ways to incorporate notebook time into the classroom, into math, social studies, science. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the session as much as I did. As Allison just said, please continue to tweet any questions at the Ed Collab Gathering Phase 2, or you can tweet, tweet directly at Rebecca and Allison. Um, I hope the re everyone is excited for the next session to begin. I'm going to go through some of the options for more fantastic PD that will be coming up. Um, in Workshop 6, Kristen and Katie will be telling us um, how to bring the digital age for today and tomorrow. In Workshop 7, Rosalyn Linder and Chris Howard Linder will be teaching us how to help students um, elaborate and add details to their writing. Um, in Workshop 8, uh, Russell and Molly will be re-energizing our student learners and giving strategies for reading and writing. And in Workshop 9, Catherine Hall and Kelly Perman will be teaching writing and identity through series blogging. I hope everyone is able to check in for those and I hope to see you there. Thank you.